back to Bananas and Books. This is Miss Caitlin. We are continuing to read Stargirl together and I'm so excited because we're already on chapters 19 and 20. So let's get started and see what is happening now. The Amish in Pennsylvania have a word for it. What's that? I said. Shunning. I was at Archie's. I had to talk to someone. Well, that's what's happening. The Shani, so to speak, has gotten himself in Dutch with the church, so he's excommunicated. The whole community is in on it. Unless he repents, nobody speaks to him for the rest of his life. Not even his family. What? That's right, not even his family. What about his wife? Wife, kids, everybody. His pipe had gone out. He relit it with a stick match. I believe the idea is to drive him away. But some stay, continue working the farm, having dinner. If he passes the salt to his wife, she ignores it. If the bishop had his way, the pigs and chickens would ignore him. It's as if he doesn't exist. I nodded. I know the feeling. We were on the back porch. I stared out at Senor Saguaro. He said, does it happen to you when you're not with her? No, I said, at least I don't think so. But I'm with her, I feel like it's aimed at me too. A small pipe, pipe cloud left the corner of his mouth. He smiled sadly. Poor dolphin, caught in a tuna net. I picked up Barney, the, paleos, the Paleocene rodent skull. I wondered if someone would be holding Cinnamon's head 60 million years from now. So what should I do? Archie waved to his hand. Oh, well, that's the easy part. Stay away from her, your problems could put. I sneered. Great advice. You know, it's not that easy. He did know, of course, but he wanted me to say it. I told him about the valentine, the night in her driveway, the walk in the desert. The question that came to mind then sounded silly, but it persisted. Do you believe in enchanted places? He took the pipe from his mouth and looked straight at me. Absolutely. I was confused. But you're a scientist, a man of science, a man of bones. You can't be up to your eyeballs and bones and not believe in enchanted places. I looked at Barney. I ran my fingertip along the hard line of his two-inch jaw, rough like a cat's tongue. Sixty million years in my hands. I looked at Archie. Why can't she be? He finished for me, like everybody else. He stood up and stepped down from the porch onto the desert. For his backyard, except for the shed where he kept his digging tools, was the desert. Nature did the landscaping. I put down Barney and joined him. We ambled towards the Nursaguaro. Not like everybody else, I said. Not exactly, not totally, but Archie. I stopped, he stopped. I turned full face to him. My thoughts and feelings were a wild, conflicting jumble. After staring stupidly at him for a long time, I blurted, she cheers for the other team. Archie pulled the pipe from his mouth as if to better digest my words. He raised one finger in the air. He nodded solemnly. Ah, yes. We resumed walking. We walked on past the tool shed, past Senor Saguaro. Occasionally, I picked up a stone and flung it toward the purple maricopas. Archie said almost in a whisper, she's not easy to put into words, is she? I shook my head. An unusual girl, he said, could see that from the first, and her parents as ordinary in a nice way as could be. How did this girl come to be? I used to ask myself. Sometimes I thought she should be teaching me she seems to be in touch with something that the rest of us are missing. He looked at me. Hmm? I nodded. He turned the mahogany bowl of his pipe upside down and wrapped it with his knuckle. A small stream of ash spilled onto a thicket of dead mesquite. He pointed the pipe stem at me. You know, there's a place we all inhabit, but we don't much think about it. We're scarcely conscious of it, and it lasts for less than a minute a day. What's that? I said. It's in the morning for most of us. It's that time, those few seconds when we're coming out of sleep but we're not really awake yet. For those few seconds, we're something more primitive than what we are about to become. We have just slept the sleep of our most distant ancestors and something of them and their world still clings to us. For those few moments, we are, unif we are unformed and uncivilized. We are not the people we know as ourselves, but creatures more in tune with a tree than a keyboard. 
We are untitled, unnamed, natural, suspended between us, and will be the tadpole before the frog, the worm before the butterfly. We are, for a few brief moments, anything and everything we could be. And then, I just have to say, boys and girls, it's a very, very beautiful passage that we just read. I hope you guys liked it too. Lots to think about. All right, continuing. He pulled out his pouch and repacked his pipe. Cherry scent flew, he struck a match. The pipe bowl, like some predator or seducer, drew down the flame. And then oh, we open our eyes and the day is before us and he snapped his fingers, we become ourselves. Like so many of Archie's words, they seem not to enter through my ears, but to settle on my skin, there to burrow like tiny eggs awaiting the rain of my maturity. And when they would hatch and I would, when they would hatch and I at last would understand. We walked in silence. Yellow blooms had appeared on a cactus and for some reason that made me incredibly sad. The purple of the mountains flowed like watercolor. They hate her, I said. He stopped, he looked intently at me. He turned me around and we headed back. He put his arm around my shoulder. Let's consult Senor Saguaro. Shortly, we were standing before the derelict giant. I never understood how the senor managed to convey a sense of dignity, majesty even, considering his stick, rickety, see-through skeleton and the ridiculous leathery crumple of hide about his foot, his fallen britches. Archie always spoke to him with respectful formality as to a judge or visiting dignitary. Good day, Senor Saguaro, he began. I believe you know my friend and charter member of the loyal order of the stone bone, Mr. Borlock. He whispered an aside to me. I'm a little rusty, but I think I'll use Spanish now. Oh boy, boys and girls, he's about to speak in Spanish and Miss Caitlin has not taken Spanish since it's been, it's been over 10 years. It's been like 15 years since she's spoken any Spanish. So this should be amusing. I'll do my best. He prefers it on delicate manners. He turned back to the cactus. Parse, sen Senor Borlock, e que es la victima de un shunning de sus compañeros estriantes en el liceo. El objeto principal del shunning es la amornada del Senor Borlock, nuestra propia Senorita Nina Estrella. El está un buqueda de preguntas. I have no idea what any of that means, but let's see what happens. As Archie spoke, he looked up toward the elf owl hole. Now he turned back to me and whispered, I asked for questions. Questions, I whispered. What about answers? But he was turning from me, tilting his head towards the great cactus, his finger on his lips. His eyes closed. I waited. At last, he nodded and turned back to me. The esteemed senor says there is only one question. What's that? I said. He says it all boils down to this, if I'm translating correctly. Whose affection do you value more, hers or the others? The senor says everything will follow from that. I wasn't sure I understood the senor any more than I understood Archie half the time, but I said nothing and I went home. In bed that night, as the moonlight reached high tide under my chin, I realized that in fact, I understood the question perfectly. I just didn't want to answer it. All right, here we go. We're on to chapter 20. Twice a week, the results of the state basketball tournament were posted on the plywood roadrunner in the courtyard. The surviving teams were into the sectionals now then would come the regionals, then with only two teams left, the big show, the Arizona State Championship. Glendale, the team we had lost to, got bitter masochistic attention on the Roadrunner with scores and foot-high numerals as they continue to win and move through the tournament. Meanwhile, Stargirl was involved in a tournament of her own, the Oratorical Contest. As Micah High's winner, she qualified for the district talk-off, as the Times called it. It took place in the auditorium of Red Rock High School, and lo and behold, Stargirl won that too. Next stop was the state finals in Phoenix on the third Friday in April. In my homeroom, when the announcement came over the PA about Stargirl winning district title, I was about to let out a cheer, but I caught myself. 
several people booed. Getting ready for the final, Stargirl practiced on me. Most often we went into the desert. She did not use notes, nor did her words seem memorized. Each time she gave the speech, it was different. She seemed to insert new material as it popped into her head. She matched her words so perfectly that the speech was not a speech at all, but one creature's voice in the wild as natural as a raven's caw or a coyote's howl at midnight. I sat cross-legged on the ground. Cinnamon sat on me. We list listened in rapture, and so I happily did the tumbleweed and cacti, the desert, the mountains, all listening to the girl in the long falling skirt. What a shame, I thought, to pack her performance into a schedule and present it to rows of plush back seats in the auditorium. Once, incredibly, an elf owl landed atop a saguaro not ten feet from where she was speaking. It paused for a full minute before ducking into its hole. Of course, we did other things too. We walked, we talked. We rode bikes. Though I had my driver's license, I bought a cheap second-hand bicycle so I could ride with her. Sometimes she led the way, sometimes I did. Whenever we could, we rode side by side. She was bendable light. She shone around every corner of my day. She taught me to revel. She taught me to wonder. She taught me to laugh. My sense of humor had always measured up to everyone else's, but timid introverted me. I showed it sparingly. I was a smiler. In her presence, I threw back my head and laughed out loud for the first time in my life. She saw things. I had not known there was so much to see. She was forever tugging at my arm and saying, look. I would look around, seeing nothing. Where? She would point. There. In the beginning, I still could not see. She might be pointing to a doorway or a person or the sky. But such things were so common to my eyes, so undistinguished, they would register as nothing. I walked in a gray world of nothings. So she would stop and point out that the front door of the house we were passing was blue, and that the last time we had passed it, it had been green, and that as near as she could tell, someone who lived in that house painted the front door a different color several times a year. Or she would whisper to me that the old man sitting alone on the bench at the Tudor Village shopping center was holding his hearing aid in his hand, and he was smiling, and he wore a coat and tie as if he were going somewhere special. And pinned it onto his and pinned onto his lapel was a tiny American flag. Or she would kneel down and pull me down with her and show me the ants, two of them, lugging the lopped leg of a beetle twenty times their size across the sidewalk as might two men, as they were they strong as ants, carry a full grown tree from one end of town to the other. After a while I began to see better. When she said look, and I followed her pointing finger, I saw eventually it became a contest, who would see first? When I finally did it, said look and pointed and tugged her sleeve, I was as proud as a first grader with a star on his paper. That's so cute. And there was more to her seeing than that. What she saw, she felt. Her eyes went straight to her heart. That's a beautiful sentence. The old man on the bench, for example, made her cry. The lumberjack ants made her laugh. The door of many colors put her in such a snit of curiosity that I had to drag her away. She felt she could not proceed with her life until she knocked on such a door. She told me how she would run the Micah Times if she were the editor. Crime would be on page 10, ants and old men in painted doors on page 1. She made up headlines. Ants haul monster load across vast barren walk. Mystery smile. Old man nods off at Tudor Village. Door begs. Knock me! I told her I wanted to be a TV director. She said she wanted to be a silver lunch truck driver. Huh? I said. You know, she said people work all morning and then it's 12 o'clock. The sec secretaries in the offices walk out the door. The construction workers put down their hard hats and hammers and everyone's hungry and they look up and there I am. No matter where they work, I'm there. I have a whole fleet of silver lunch trucks. They go everywhere. Let lunch come to you. That's my slogan. Just seeing my silver lunch truck makes them happy. She described how she would roll up the side panels and everyone would practically faint at the cloud of wonderful smells. Hot food, cold food, Chinese, Italian, you name it. Even a salad bar. They can't believe how much food I fit into my truck. No matter where you are, out in the desert, the mountains, even down the mines, if you want my silver lunch service, I get it to you. I find a way. I tagged along on missions. One day she bought a small plant, an African violet, in a plastic pot on sale for 99 cents at a drugstore. Who's it for? I asked her. 
I'm not exactly sure, she said. I just know that someone at an address on Marion Drive is in the hospital for surgery, so I thought who's ever back home could use a little cheering up. How do you know about this stuff? I said. She gave me a mysterious grin, a mischievous grin. I have my ways. She went, we went to the house on Marion Drive. She reached into the saddle pack behind her bicycle seat. She pulled out a handful of ribbons. She chose a pale violet one that matched the color of the tiny blossoms and stuffed the remaining ribbons back into the seat pack. She tied the violet ribbon around the pot. I held her bike while she set the plant by the front door. Riding away, I said, why don't you leave a card or something with your name on it? The question surprised her. Why should I? Her question surprised me. Well, I don't know. It's just the way people do things. They expect it. They get a gift. They expect to know where it came from. Is that important? Yeah, I guess. I never finished that thought. My tires shuddered as I slammed my bike to a halt. She stopped ahead of me. She backed up. She stared. Leo, what is it? I wagged my head. I grinned. I pointed at her. It was you. Me what? Two years ago, my birthday. Oh my lord, boys and girls. I found a package on my front step, a porcupine necktie. I never found out who gave it to me. She walked her bike alongside mine. She grinned. A mystery. Where did you find it? I said. I didn't. I had my mother make it. She didn't seem to want to dwell on the subject. She started pedaling and we continued on our way. Where were we, she said. Getting credit, I said. What about it? Well, it's nice to get credit. The spoke of her real wheel spun behind the curtain of her long skirt. She looked like a photograph from a hundred years ago. She turned her wide eyes on me. Is it? She said. Oh, my heart, boys and girls. That's the end of chapter 20. Oh, I love Leo and Stargirl together. It's my fave. Um, so I hope you all enjoy your healthy snack and I will see you all next time.